it's just call to order then. Okay, this is teaching and learning, um, January 12th, 2016. Just to review the numbers, this is out of Bremen, requesting an additional section of health. So they had five periods. Um, collectively, they were over by 22 students, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to add a period, um, six period. Also, six period, um, the FLC was at 75 students. So that will help alleviate pulling some students out of there for the health class, taking them out of the FLC. And we have a part-time health teacher that is teaching the class. So this is kind of the formality since I called each of you to, right. to put that in place, which is formally getting it approved by the board. Um, just you know, since we put this section in place, um, period one became balanced. Period two is only over by two. Period five is under by five. And what I mean under, under the top of the window, which is 32. Period seven is under by six. Period six has a class size of 28, and then period eight is only over by one. So, so instead of 100% being over, we're only two over, yeah. okay. which was good. Okay. Next item, overnight field trip request coming out of Hillcrest Band. It's really great to see these kids. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, getting out there and starting to get, um, playing in performances and getting feedback from um, you know, from people in the field. So this is really nice. Um, they're they're going to be going um, Friday, the twenty second. So there'll be one loss of school day. Um, going down to Tennessee to perform. They'll actually be performing Friday night, and then uh, so the per concert band will perform Friday night. Parade band will perform Saturday morning. Both bands will get feedback from staff, and they'll actually have an award ceremony Saturday night. So the cost will be completely up to the student, $425, sharing um, rooms where appropriate, 35 students attending, um, and you'll see the chaperones there. So any questions or concerns about band? They fundraise, I take it, to help raise some of the money for Yeah, them. as much as they can. Yeah. Everybody okay with that? Awesome. All right, the next item, I'm going to jump to the other before we go into the, the Danielson piece. This was something um, Dr. Kendall just wanted me to, to bring to your attention. He's going to bring it to the board um, next week. Um, Northern Illinois University is looking to partner with all the way down to middle schools, middle schools and high schools. And what they're looking to do is build a partnership between middle school, elementary schools, and community colleges to, to try to funnel students into engineering programs. Um, and so what they're really focusing on is not somebody that's going to go out and be a, a civil engineer, but there's a lot of engineering jobs that are kind of entry level, second tier, I would say, types of positions. And so they want to build this partnership of trying to get students to go through maybe a non-traditional route. Instead of going to a university for a four-year engineering degree, starting off at the community college, getting all of the um, general education requirements in, together and then feeding right into a potential engineering career and, and degree. So they're just looking for a um, letter of support, if you will, for this program. So the website that's in the um, letter itself, it's um, in the first paragraph, the second to the last sentence. For some reason, the full link didn't work, but if you take out South Suburban SHTML, you'll actually come to this page, which is um, the community partnership page. And so you'll see this whole list of community colleges that have already agreed to be a part of this partnership, South Suburban being one of them, along with Julia Junior College, Prairie State in our area. Marine Valley. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Are those the engineering programs that Northern has, electrical and industrial? Yes. I don't remember them having an engineering department. <laughs> yeah. And so if I click on, you know, South Suburban, the 2 plus 2, it'll take me, I, you know, if I want to be an electrical engineer, industrial systems, or mechanical, um, if I click on this piece, it'll tell me, okay, here's what I need to take at South Suburban oh, wow. specifically. And then what's going to be required of me when I transfer into Northern. Nice. And then the kids have the numbers. They know that this stuff will transfer. Exactly. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah, definitely take a look at, at the website. You know, something that we're going to continue to explore, especially as, as we're trying to develop this career pathway piece for our students, um, showing them, you know, South Suburban is a great opportunity to start, get those general credits out of the way, much more cost effective for our students, and then they can see how they can go right into this bachelor's degree. It's a, a five-year program in Illinois. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, and this is just mainly an informational piece, but looking for the board to support this partnership with them. It really does, doesn't require anything on our end in terms of money. It's just getting the word out and trying to, to show students those pathways. Sure. And then this will be this will be available for all the kids to mm -hmm. look at. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yep. Okay. All right. I promise I won't keep you here for three hours tonight. <laughs> but I wanted to take some time to explore the Danielson framework with you. And I wanted to start off first by asking, did you have any questions about the last presentation? No. History. I think you went through it very well. Okay. Good. I know that was a lot, a lot of information. So today, just Danielson, strictly focused on professional practice. Again, our overarching goal is we want our kids to be college and career ready when they leave us. Um, and with that overarching goal and focusing on the three areas, academic achievement, college and career development, and the learning environment, as we start to delve deeper into teaching and learning, as we talked about in the last meeting, you know, we're, we're causing some discomfort with the teachers because we're trying to make change, and change is difficult for people. Um, and so we're trying to, to put things in place to help them through that change process, ultimately because we're here for the students. So how do we improve student achievement for all students? I realize that our poster is still here from last meeting. I didn't know. Last night. <laughs> I came in, I'm like, oh, that's still here. That's nice. Let's look at what are the expectations of a teacher in terms of the Danielson framework. And I wanted to start off by just giving you a quick little overview on the research on how students learn. The National Research Council um, study produced three key findings, and they keep, re they keep going back over and over this research to make sure it's current. Um, but the, the same three themes continue to pop up. The first thing they talk about is students, teachers need to engage students' prior understandings. Kids come into the classroom with a certain amount of knowledge. Could be the right knowledge, it could be the wrong knowledge, but they have knowledge. And so it's important for us as teachers to find out where are you at, what do you know about this subject before I teach it. And so that's where the, the concept of a pretest comes in. Um, so I want it, here's what I want to cover, what do you know? Because if you already know it, why am I going to waste your time and my time? Let's move on to what you don't know. Or let's take that information and go a little bit deeper. Okay, so that's one thing. A lot of times by doing a pretest, it gives teachers an idea of what misconceptions a student has coming into the classroom. They may have been taught something wrong. I need to know that so I know how to undo it. Okay. The second thing, the second finding is deep, students need to develop deep factual knowledge and then apply that to new situations. So it's this concept of teaching deeper covering less but deeper instead of that broader focus. And we're having a struggle right now because this is what, you know, Common Core is putting the focus back on critical thinking skills. 
And so when we say we want to teach deeper and less, a lot of people equate that to we're watering down the curriculum. And that's not the case at all. So we want to pare down what it is that students really need to know and make sure they know it really well. Okay, so that's that next concept. And it's this whole idea of what does an expert do compared to a novice? An expert has a wealth of information, but they can problem solve and apply that information to new situations. And that's what we want our students to be able to do. And then the third key finding, which we don't, we as educators don't do very well, is allow students the opportunity to self-monitor. We, we have to make sure that we increase the student's ability to transfer that new knowledge. Okay, I just learned this piece of information. I came into the classroom knowing this, now I'm presented with this new information. Does that change what I already know? Or does it support what I already know? Or does, do I find out, wow, what I knew was wrong, and now I have this new information? We don't necessarily take that time to do that self-assessment. Where am I in the learning process? And that's that whole concept of metacognition. Do I know what I know along the way? Are you saying that's done by the student? It is. Yeah. It is. Can you show them tools for that? <laughs> we do sometimes. I'll give you an example. So um, one tool that I used to use in the classroom is I would create a list of basically I can statements. And it was meant for the student. At the end of this unit, I can identify the three different types of leaves. I can tell the difference between a monocot and a dicot. So I would introduce those at the beginning of the unit. And then partway through, I would have the students do a self-assessment. Okay, here's what we've covered so far. What do you know? Do you know it all? Do you know part of it or you know nothing? And then we come back before the test and again do a self-assessment. What do you know? What do you not know? What do you know partly? Now you know where to focus your attention when you study. Don't study on what you already know. Focus on what you know halfway or what you don't know at all. So that's an example of teaching students how to self-monitor. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes many, many forms. So the Danielson framework is actually made up of four domains. And you see them here, and notice that they're interconnected circles. Danielson really talks about how each of these domains are equally important. No one is more important with the other. So domain one is planning and preparation. What does a teacher do before actually delivering a lesson? It's all the thought process, that behind the scenes work. Domain two is the classroom environment. What does my room look like? How do my students operate? What are my relationships all about? Do I have a good set of procedures? Um, do my students know how to operate in terms of behavior? Uh, things of that nature. Is my physical space organized for learning? Or do I have stuff all over the place that you know, students could get injured? Domain three is the instruction is actually what happens, that delivery, engagement of the students, that questioning and discussion technique, how am I assessing them? So that's the actual teaching and learning piece. And then professional responsibilities is domain four. This is outside the classroom. What is the teacher doing to communicate with families, to um, maintain accurate records, to grow and develop as a professional? It's really important. So these are all the different areas that we look at. Notice the two um, outside the classroom environment and the instruction, that's what we used to have in our old evaluation tool. Those were the only two things that we really measured. We never really assessed teachers on how they planned ahead of time and we never really assess them on their professional responsibilities. So this is some new learning for the teachers. What would I'm sorry. Sort of the professional responsibility be? Okay, so papers or taking extra classes? It is, it's, it's yes. It's are they maintaining grades appropriately? Are they keeping a grade book? Are they taking attendance? So some of these um, district regulations that they're doing. Are they going to school? Are they um, taking new workshops? Are they participating in the school? Are they volunteering, being part of you know, the food drive or the spirit showdown? Um, one key piece is, are they reflecting on their practice? At the end of an observation, we ask them to do a reflection. So here's what you said you were gonna do. How do you know that the kids actually learned? If they didn't learn, what would you do differently? If they did learn, how would you make it better? So it's that reflective piece, which we've never asked them to do before. So in essence, we're asking the teachers to metacognitively think about their practice, just like we want the students to, okay? And then there's another piece, um, it's called, um, oh, I just, showing professionalism. It's the last component of, of four, domain four. Basically, it talks about um, how are you advocating for students above and beyond the classroom? And that can take many, many forms. Um, for an example, you know, a teacher may recognize that a student all of a sudden stopped doing homework. 
and the teacher pulled that student aside and realized that their parent had just passed away. So maybe they might refer that student to the social worker or the psychologist. So it's going about, but then not letting that go, you know, okay, I'm gonna refer you, but follow up, hey, you know, psychologist, so-and-so, how is my student doing? You know, I heard they lost their parents, what have you been working on with them, et cetera. So that's kind of advocating above and beyond. Mm -hmm. So there's those four domains and they talk about a distinct aspect of teaching. Within the domains there are components and there is a total of 22 components. This is what the teacher should actually do in a particular domain. So just like we described professional responsibilities, what does instruction look like? What is planning and preparation? What are the requirements of those domains? And then each component has a set of elements. So there's 76 elements. This describes what a teacher should know in order to effectively carry out that component. So I'm going to share with you, and this is for, your, for you to keep. So we call these smart cards, and this um, every teacher has a copy of this, and every observer, we, we use these often as we're going through our evaluation. So starting in the top left, planning and preparation, you'll see that there are six components. Everything from the teacher's knowledge of the content and how the content is developed in a, in a student. Do I know my students? What is it that I want to accomplish for the day, for the week, for the unit? Those are the instructional outcomes. Do I know what resources are available to me? 1E e is actually the lesson planning itself, designing that instruction from start to finish. What are my students going to be doing for 55 minutes? And then student assessment. So all of those pieces describe that behind the scenes piece before we even get into the instruction. Moving to the right, domain two, the classroom environment, we're looking at five components. Creating an environment of respect and rapport. What are the relationships like between the teacher and the student, and the student to the student? Establishing a culture for learning. What we're doing in here is really important. I want to make sure you all understand, and I want you to have pride in what you're doing here. Managing classroom procedures. This is everything from, does a student know where to turn in their homework? Do they know the procedure? If we're in a discussion, do I raise my hand? Do I not raise my hand? Do I shout out? What does the teacher allow? How much time is lost in between moving from one activity to another? We're looking, so that's that transition piece. Do kids know where to get materials? Do they know where to put them back, etc. Managing student behavior. Are the students aware of the classroom rules, if you will? and how to operate in the classroom, and then that physical space. Not only is my classroom organized to maximize learning, but do I know the learning needs of my students? Do I know if a student is visually impaired, I'm not gonna put them in the back of the room, they need to sit in the front of the room. And so we have those conversations. Down to the bottom right is the instruction, so what actually happens in the classroom. Communicating with students is how the teacher actually delivers information, so in essence, think of it as the lecture part of teaching. Not only that, it's how do I deliver instruction? Am I clear in terms of what students need to do? My question and discussion techniques, I look at not only the quality of question by the teacher, but also by the student. What am I doing to engage students in a discussion? And how many students are participating? Engaging students in the learning is what the kids are actually doing. So if I'm done lecturing and I'm putting the students in groups or independent work, what is it that they're working on? Is it a worksheet? Is it a writing prompt? What have you. Assessment instruction. Here I'm circulating around and I'm giving feedback to my students about their performance on whatever the activity is. And then lastly, demonstrating flexibility and responsiveness. This is one that's not necessarily um, it doesn't necessarily surface in a way, um, what I mean is we don't see a teacher standing up there and when you see the group of students struggling say, okay, class, I see that you're struggling. I'm going to demonstrate flexibility and responsiveness and we're going to try something different. It's very subtle what the teacher does. If the teacher recognizes that the whole class isn't understanding something. Mm -hmm. The teacher may stop and say, you know what, I see that you, you are all struggling. Let's try it a different way and then tries a different approach. Sometimes we don't know about it because um, we, nece we don't necessarily have that cue. So in that reflection piece, we ask the teachers, if you departed from your plan, what did you do and why? Mm -hmm. Since I didn't give you that cue, I would say, well, you know what, I noticed 25 of my students were not understanding the material, so this is why I gave them a different example. And that gives us some insight into this piece. 
And then the professional responsibilities, um, I mentioned all of them there, reflecting on teaching, maintaining accurate records, communicating with families, participating in professional learning communities. So that's what are the rela relationships like between teachers? Are they participating in school projects, their service to the school, growing and developing professionally? Is there um, their own self-learning? And then that's showing professionalism. So those are all the 22 components. If you notice the little bullets underneath each component, those are the elements. And if you were to count up all the bullets, there's actually 76 of them. So if a teacher is really struggling on understanding, managing classroom procedures, because it's a big thing, well, what are all the different components? You'll notice there's actually five elements within managing classroom procedures. They may be really good at organizing materials and supplies in the non-instructional duties, meaning taking attendance, but their transitions need some work. So we can isolate it down to something very specific instead of saying, you know, Kim, you need to work on managing classroom procedures. Well, what aspect of, the, of that are you referring to? We can drill it down to something specific. And, and these are determined by someone sitting in the class for one, one time? Actually, uh, it's depending upon where the teacher is at in their cycle. If they are a tenured teacher, we observe them twice or more. Non-tenure teacher, it's three times or more. Three times in an entire school year. Yes. And actually, the, and that's even less because the uh, um, evaluation window is really from the start of the school year till the end of February. Because all the evaluations have to be wrapped up by March 1st. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's a lot. I could understand a bit why they're feeling, you know, overwhelmed. Yes, in a sense that this is new learning for them. Right. But I'm going to show you where the teacher's responsibility lies and where the observer responsibility lies. Because you're right, if I were a teacher looking at this, oh my gosh, I have to know 76 elements, 22 components, and four domains. Yeah, we don't want the kids learning loss in the teachers trying to just meet this and Correct. not the students' needs. Correct. Yeah. yeah, so it's getting them to understand. And just like we did in, um, last month, I showed you we, in our old model, actually assessed all of this except for two components, the 4A, the reflecting on teaching, and the 1F, designing student assessments. Otherwise, the other 20 components were already in our old model. This is just reorganized in a different way. Okay. But it wasn't used in tenured teachers. The difference was is we didn't look at each component. We had the list of components, but every observer determined what was important for that evaluation. Does that make sense? So I may say, you know what, instruction to me is the most important thing in the classroom, so I'm only going to evaluate the teacher on that and not consider the so others. So the observer was pretty much deciding what they were. Yes. Okay. And it may not align with what the teacher thought uh -huh. best teaching could be, and that's where you had some, some difficulties. Yes, so we try to work really hard with this framework to eliminate that, what we call bias. We need to leave our bias at the door. It doesn't matter what I think good teaching looks like. This is the framework that we're all operating off of, and this is the rubric we're all going to use. And you're going to be judged on this. Whether I like it or not, this is what we've agreed to. Okay. So one of the things that we do with the teachers in our teacher training is we take a look at the connections between all of these pieces. And again, no one domain is more important than the other. You can't have, in essence, one without the other as the song goes. So like you see in this um, example here, in order for me as a classroom teacher to have good question and discussion technique, I have to have an environment of respect and rapport. It kind of goes back to what what you talked about last month is teachers need or students need to feel safe to participate, to ask a question, to answer a question, not feel like they're going to get ridiculed. So see if you can come up with a relationship between two components. What would be another example? You can't have this without this. The 
designing coherent instruction with demonstrating flexibility and responsiveness because you have to be aware of all the different levels of the kids that are in your classroom. Not everybody learns the same. So you may have a way that, and maybe I'm not explaining right, you know, you think I'm going to teach this this way, but I have five learners like this and five learners like this and five, so now you have to figure out how to make your instruction coherent for all of these kids to get it. Yes, yeah, sure. So I have a plan in mind that takes into consideration I have these three different groups. But not only do I have to have this plan, I might want to have a backup plan because as I instruct, I may find that the students didn't grasp it the first way. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of them in there. Yeah. Demonstrating knowledge of students and managing student behavior. They go together. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Organizing physical space. It really depends on the kids. Yeah, it really, when you look at it all that way, it all really, you know, goes together. Yes. In order, in, in not only across domains, but within the same domain. In exactly. order for me to design student assessments, I have to know what it is I'm trying to teach. Mm -hmm. So I have to know my outcomes. And so that's what we kind of do with the teachers as we initially introduce this. There's no right or wrong answer, but you can see even though this is the behind the scenes piece, it has an impact not only on the environment, but also my instruction. What I learn professionally will impact my planning. If I learn some new strategies mm -hmm. about my content, that's going to impact my design. And I would think a lot of them are already doing this. They just haven't followed that. Yes. Right. And that was much of the aha moments, especially the first year through, is they did see, yeah, I'm already doing these things. Yeah. They just it didn't just have the label. It's overwhelming when you present it in this format. It does. Yeah. It does. Now, if you take a look at the smart card itself, and notice it's the, we can divide it actually in half. Mm -hmm. And notice that domains one and four are on the left, and two and three are on the right. Left brain, right? <laughs> not, not necessarily <laughs> left brain, right brain. But whose responsibility for the evidence is domain one and four? Mm -hmm. Right, that's the teacher. The teacher, the teacher does the planning and preparation. And the teacher has to demonstrate the professional responsibilities. The teacher has to go out and learn more, making sure that they're maintaining accurate records. So the bulk of the evidence that's produced for domains one and four comes from the teacher. So now instead of being responsible for 22, how, am I, how many am I responsible for? 11. And two and three is actually what happens in the classroom. This is the direct observation, and the evidence for this is collected by the observer. Now we're trying to drill down, make it more manageable and understandable for both sides. So let's talk about evidence for the evaluation. Evidence for the evaluation comes from three forms. The first one are artifacts. And artifacts are produced by the teacher or the observer. Example would be um, lesson plans. We have planning and reflection conference questionnaires. So before I sit down with the teacher for the first formal observation, there's uh, four questions they have to answer, as well as produce some lesson plans. The, the point is between the lesson plans and the questionnaire, I should get a nice picture of domain one. What is the teacher planning for those students? Where were they before? What am I actually going to see? And how does that information help for the days after? And so the goal is to try to hit all six components with those two documents. If we don't, then it requires some supplemental information, meaning give me a copy of the test that you're going to use for this unit. How do you demonstrate knowledge of your students? Show me a seating chart that shows my visually impaired students with my hard of hearing students, with students that need whatever accommodations they happen to be, things like that. And so artifacts, again, are mostly for domains one and four, things that we don't directly observe. Okay. The second piece of, art of evidence comes from the scripted notes, and this is done by the observer. And this is um, mostly for domains two and three, and it can also include notes from conferences. So I may add some lines of script. A lot of times we actually put the notes on the questionnaires, but I could add some things in our meetings into those scripted notes. So it's a record of what occurred. The third piece of evidence comes from the student growth data. And this is only for teachers and media specialists. And we're not going to look at this tonight. We'll look at this at the next meeting, the student growth piece, because it's a whole other animal. 
Okay, so we're just going to focus on artifacts and the scripted notes. All right, so artifacts again, lesson plans. I believe we looked at last month the three lesson plan templates that the district evaluation committee created. I'll jump there really quick. So one of the things that we heard from the teaching staff over the first two years is, could you give us a lesson plan template to help us organize what you're looking for? And we put it off and put it off on purpose because we didn't want to force teachers into planning a certain way because everybody plans differently. But after listening to the teachers um, and the administrators too because they weren't able to find the information because it was all over the place, is we came up with three different lesson plan templates, one that's aligned to the Danielson framework, one that's aligned to Madeline Hunter, which many of our veteran teachers um, grew up learning that, that form of lesson planning. And then one uses the understanding by design, which is our model for designing curriculum. And so the district evaluation committee endor basically endorsed these three templates, identified the strengths and weaknesses so teachers knew if you're gonna choose this framework, here's what's strong about it, but beware this is what's missing, so you need to support it with other pieces of evidence. And we also said, use these, don't use these, it's entirely up to you. Not Any one of these is not necessarily gonna give you an excellent domain one, it's what you put in it that counts. Okay. And so we took a look at the Danielson one, I'll just bring up the um, understanding by design one. I like it on the new websites, by the way. Good. Yeah, the app is cool. Good. Yeah, very good. Good to hear. Uh, okay, that's good. Take too long. Let's do this way. There you go. So this is the basically how we write curriculum is how some of our teachers actually plan their lessons. So tell us a little bit about where you are in your teaching, what standards are you're addressing, enduring understandings or what we want the students to remember 10 years from now. Those are the big ideas. Those in essence are our outcomes. What are your essential questions? Um, taking those understandings and delving down even uh, more specific. What evidence are you gonna collect? So how do you know that the students have learned what you intended? What are your actual learning activities? What resources are you bringing in? What special accommodations do you have? What higher order questions are you planning? Tell us a little bit about your students, how you're gonna differentiate your outcomes. Um, and so that's the understanding by design template. And so again, the lesson plan, the goal is to have that piece of evidence cover as much of domain one as possible it does take a lot of work for the teacher to to develop these lesson plans because what we're looking for is five days of lesson plans the day of the observation must be in depth so one of those templates that, you know at least multiple pages because um, we want to know about your students and specific questions that you're asking and then the two days before and two days after the observation can be abbreviated versions basically we're looking for what are your objectives what are your standards what activities are you doing and what is your assessment so it's that modified version. But we want to see, here's where they were, here's a you know, full-blown lesson plan for the day that I'm actually going to come and see you, and then how does that set you up for the next two days. So it gives me a good flow of what it is you're trying to teach. Okay. So what are some other examples? Here's an example of an artifact. This is an exit ticket that um, one of our teachers actually uses, and there's a quote. It says, each handicap is like a hurdle in a steeplechase, and when you ride up to it, if you throw your heart over it, the horse will go along too, by Lawrence Bixby. And so the question to the student is, what is your greatest handicap at this time, and how will you throw your heart over it? What will you do to accept or overcome it? Right? Yeah. And so as an observer, I would ask the teacher, well, what we do, first of all, if you notice the top right-hand corner, what we ask of the teachers is provide us an artifact. You tell us which component it aligns with. So of the, now we're narrowing it down to domain one or domain four, where does it go? Why is this an example of a particular component and give us a date? So what do you think a teacher could possibly use this for? 
possibly an assessment. Okay, we read this story about a, someone that had a handicap. Do you understand what that means by relating it to yourself? So that could be one thing. And so where would we would put that with what component? I'm over in domain one. One F. So the teacher would write one F. My rationale is I want to un, um, know if my students understand what a handicap is by relating it to their personal life. And then I would put today's date. Now another thing a teacher could use this for, I'm going to give you the component, you tell me how it could possibly fit, is 1B. Why would this be an example of 1B? Well, it gives them more of, of the student's background and you get to know them more on a personal level. Yes, exactly. So we as the observers don't want to assume what this artifact is actually for. We want the teachers to tell us because we don't want to make the wrong um, judgment call on it. So we allow them. Now, when they come to us and say, you know, this is an example of 1F and that's all that they recognize, we might have a conversation. Well, how could you use this in 1B? How is this providing you more information about your students and try to open up their eyes a little bit to some other possibilities? One more. So this is an example of a graphic organizer. The subject is Harriet Jacobs. Um, the directions say complete the graphic organizer focusing on Jacobs' character traits using support from the text showing where Harriet stood in moments of challenge and controversy. So graphic organizers, this can be used in a couple of different ways. First off, if I'm going to use it for the whole class and I'm starting to teach my students about writing and narrowing down to a character and trying to develop evidence to support, I'm demonstrating my knowledge of content and pedagogy, meaning students need to organize their thoughts in order to write effectively. So this is a strategy that I would use to do that. Kind of like an outline, in, in a little more fun way maybe, yeah. for the student. Exactly. Or a different way to look at it instead of just bullet points. Yes, yes. Sometimes that visualization of almost mind clouds. Right, you know, thoughts exactly how their thoughts are coming out, put it yes. out. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Another place I could use this, going back to 1B, demonstrate knowledge of students. If I know my students well, and I know that there's a pocket of students that really struggle with writing, I may give those students the graphic organizer, but the rest of the class does not have it because they're good writers already. They know how to organize. So that's a different way of using the same graphic organizer. Okay. So they go through the process of identifying all these pieces of, of evidence that could align to each of the components. When we first started out with Danielson, we did not put a limit on artifacts because we didn't know going through it the first time what teachers would turn in again. We didn't want to limit what teachers could give us. We wanted to leave that open-ended. But we found teachers ran the gamut. We actually had a teacher that turned in nine two-inch binders of artifacts. Wow. Yes. But I mean, I guess there's no wrong in that because you could relate it to... You could, but it's almost, it's too much. Mm -hmm. And then we had some teachers that only turned in one for each component. So we wanted to make sure that really we wanted to drill down to give us your best artifacts to represent each of those components. So we came up with a limit of six, six per component. You can have less, but no more than six. So comb through, don't just give us anything, give us your six best or less for each of those components. Remember that though for domain one, their lesson plans and their planning conference questionnaire will cover the bulk of that domain anyway, you're just supplementing it with some more pieces. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions about artifacts. And those we gather throughout the whole evaluation cycle. There's no, um, you know, they're not due at a certain point until the end. They're actually um, coming up on their deadline right now. By the end of January, on January 25th, all the artifacts are due. And the reason we do that is it gives the observers about a month to evaluate the artifacts, put them into the framework, and provide feedback to the teacher. The sooner we can provide that feedback, the more opportunity a teacher has to grow and learn from that and possibly produce some new artifacts. If we don't have that feedback loop, once they get the rating, it's over. They don't, we don't have that opportunity for discussion. You know, or that opportunity to say, hey, did you know that graph? I noticed that you didn't have anything really for 1B. Tell me about how another way you could use this graphic organizer for your students. 
and see if they can get to that point of, oh, I could use this for differentiation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. Let's talk about scripting. So what is a scripted piece of evidence? It is actually a record of what happens in the classroom. It's what the teacher says and does and what the students say and do. We try to capture as much verbatim as possible. Okay? And then we'll talk about how it's used in the evaluation process. So if you would, on your agenda, write down in a vertical column numbers one through six. Do they record in the observation? Is it recorded? No. Video or audio recorded? No video or audio. And the reason being, um, Charlotte actually talks about this, is you want to um, see the lesson as it is one time only. Because when you videotape or audio record, you're listening to it over and over and over again. You make it to the point where you're so hypercritical and you're dissecting things too much. Mm -hmm. Capture it as best as you can. You can always go back in for another drop in. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna put up six statements. If you think it's a piece of evidence, put an E next to the number. Or if you think it's an opinion, put an O. The classroom was welcoming. Is that a piece of evidence or is that somebody's opinion? Number two, students were engaged in the lesson. Evidence or opinion? Number three, teacher repeated the directions three times. Number four, teacher assessed students informally. Number five, during a student presentation, two students were texting, two students sharpened pencils, one student drummed loudly on the desk. And number six, teacher used a question as a teachable moment. And this is something that we did early on um, with the teachers as we put together statements just like this. And we had them go through and do exactly what you did. Because um, we found in our old evaluation process, we tended to write more interpretations and opinions than strictly the facts. Okay, and that's where you kind of get into trouble with, um, again, bringing in what I think good teaching is or not good teaching is, as opposed to this is what the evidence says and now let's put it against a framework. So let's see how you did. Numbers one, two, four, and six were all opinion. And three and five were evidence. So what's wrong with number one? Well, everyone has a different version of what's welcoming, yeah. Exactly. How about students were engaged in the lesson? how they're showing that. You could, they could just be sitting there like this and be getting it or not. And how do you know that they're getting and it? And you don't know if they're What does engaged mean? That's a term that we throw around a lot. We need to break it down to what do we actually mean? What are we trying to say? Yeah, if the lesson was to be writing a paragraph and everybody was writing, they were they're engaged. Yes, exactly. Number three is a piece of evidence. Number four, teacher assess the students informally. Oh. How? Five was evidence six. Teacher used a question as a teachable moment. What did you say, Evelyn? I thought it was evidence. Oh. It was generic. Yeah, I, I thought that was evidence too because she's asking a question. So if the students are, part, to me, if students are participating off of that question, that's evidence to show that was a teachable moment because they're reacting to it. But. Yeah, what would be better is what did the, act, the teacher actually what, what ask the and then what did the students do in response? So we really work on coming up with, here's some examples of how to turn the opinion into evidence. So rather than saying the classroom was welcoming, we would say mm -hmm. the teacher stood at the door and welcomed each student by name as she, he or she came into the classroom. That's actually what happened. Hello, good morning, how are you? All students had their eyes on the teacher as he or she modeled the next activity. Now we're defining what engagement is. All eyes were on the teacher. Teacher assess the students informally. So here, let's be specific. Teacher says, give me a thumbs up if you're ready to move on. 
teacher quickly walked around the classroom to monitor pro progress of the science project. So we're trying to be very specific about what actually occurred, not trying to, to define or interpret what that was. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? And then the last one, instead of saying the question is a teacher moment, what is the question? Teacher, interesting thought. What does everyone else think? How do you think those two animals get along in the wild? Kind of, again, we want to be very specific. Okay, so we spent a lot of time not only in our training, so that 60 plus hours of training, we spent a lot of time checking our biases, making sure that we understood what's an interpretation, what's an opinion, what's a bias, and what's an actual piece of evidence. And we've gotten very good at sticking to just evidence. Okay. So then how is it used in the evaluation process? So I go into an observation, whether it's formal or informal, and I'm literally, I have my computer up, and I'm typing what the teacher says and does and what the students say and do. And I do that for the entire 55 minutes. I may also get up and collect some data on the side. Um, I may actually take my computer and sit down next to a group of students and record their interaction. Even though the teacher is off doing something else, we want to make sure that we're capturing what the students are saying and doing. because There's some really rich pieces of um, evidence that come from that. And then we sit down after the observation is over and we actually align the scripted evidence to the framework. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. Some cases, the scripts, and we really try to get um, better at honing in on what exactly is that piece of evidence aligned to. You don't want to align it to six, seven, or eight components because that's not giving the teacher very specific feedback. What is it that you're trying to say and which component does it go with? You'll see an example where a line of script could be com coded to two or three components, but we try to limit. You shouldn't have a lot. Okay. What we do then is we sort all the scripts by component and we look for patterns of behavior. So let me show you what that looks like. So this is an excerpt from a teacher, the first observation, and you'll see it's timestamped. So this is a running tally. When the class started, you only have um, X number of lines, but until the class ended, every time we hit return, it timestamps it for us. We don't, excuse me, we don't have to worry about it. So you'll notice um, a couple of lines here, 715, you'll notice it's the same line of text, but it's coded to do to two different places. Part of this, what same the teachers, the yeah, same with the first one and also same with the last one was repeated three times. So depending upon what the observer puts into the text, what we tried to work on is um, don't have it as a running script in one big paragraph because that's really hard to code, is to try to separate out specific pieces of evidence. So um, going down to um, 7.15 a.m., the teacher asked the class how they're doing. He asked if they enjoyed their testing yesterday. That's an indication that there's a good relationship between the teacher and the students. But because I also um, put the teacher said, hopefully you heeded my advice and took the test seriously, is also an example of creating a culture for learning because he's really um, trying to stress to the students what we're doing in here is really helping you prep this as an AP class to prep you for the test. The last uh, line of script, 723, you'll notice it's in three places. Students proceed to the first station and begin working immediately is aligned to managing classroom procedures. So the teacher has organized how things are going to operate in the class. 
It's also aligned to 3A because the students immediately went to where they were supposed to go, so there was no confusion, meaning that the teacher's directions were really clear. And it's also an indication of 3C that the students were engaged on the task. They knew what to do. So that's an example of where it can go into multiple places. So at first glance, when the teacher sees this, they see this running tally, and it's interesting. We ask the teachers to read through it and make sure we didn't put any pieces of opinion, we don't have any interpretation or bias. If we do, let us know, and we need to clean it up because we don't want that in there. But teachers are amazed when they read this. They're like, I did all of that in 55 minutes. <laughs> you, they don't realize what they do. Then we send them, if you turn to page two, then what we do is we sort all of that scripted evidence, and you'll notice it's sorted, and I color-coded it so you can see the break in the data. Now it's sorted by component. And you'll see all the 1Ds together, and the 2As, and the 2Bs, and the 2Cs, et cetera, et cetera. The reason we do this is the next phase of the evaluation process is we look for patterns of behavior. So when I sit down and I look at all of my evidence for 3A, what is it telling me about their performance of the teacher at that particular moment? Mm -hmm. And this is where the framework comes into play, and I'm, we're going to practice that in a minute. And as I go through the observation and the evaluation process, I'm adding more and more data to this scripted note. Now this is one observation. When I go and do the second observation, more evidence is added and this list grows by component. And it gives us a nice feel for what the teacher actually does for each of these items. Are these dated? Yes, the new template actually has a date. So not only, as soon as I hit return, not only does it timestamp, but it date stamp. So we can tell the difference between the observations when they actually right. occurred. Yes. Mm -hmm. So questions about the scripting. We'll capture, and again, depending upon the lesson, depending upon how much time is spent, on average, about 100 to 150 lines of script for one observation. And does the they sort, the computer sort them? Yeah, Mike Mikosi actually created um, a spreadsheet, What and there's multiple tabs on it. So the first tab is the original, where I actually do my typing, and I do my coding. And it's automatically creating a second copy behind it. And then the observer just goes in and highlights all the fields and does a sort. So it's pretty simple. But the observer is doing the coding? Yes. Yep. What we do, though, is we encourage the teachers, go back and read through the script. Not only are you checking for evidence, make sure we don't have any opinion or bias, but if you see that a possible line of script could code somewhere else, let us know. We want the teachers to take ownership of the scripted evidence and see, oh, I, I think this piece of evidence goes over here. Let's have a conversation about it. And at what point do they get this, the teacher? So within five days after the formal observation, they get it uncoded. And most observers get it back that day or the next day. And then they have 10 days to return the coded script to them. The most of them do it. The observers have to get it back to them in 10 days. And the reason being is we want them to use this evidence when they do their reflection. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so a lot of teachers will actually refer back to this when they're doing their evidence, their reflections. Right, so they can remember what they were working on that day when they were sitting there. Exactly, because a lot of times we're also capturing pieces of data that goes with it. How many questions that they're asking, how many students responded. They may not necessarily remember that, but it would be the in the code. Mm -hmm. Or is it the same students? And that's really hard. Especially if, we, if the students mixed and they're not seating in rows, if we don't have a seating chart, we may not necessarily know the kids. So that's where it gets a little bit difficult. We try to say student one, student two, student three, but sometimes it's difficult in that aspect. Any other questions about the scripts? No. Okay, so let's talk about how do we actually pull all these pieces together. Before we do that, let's look at understanding the levels. So the levels are determined by evidence, and again, depending upon which domain you're working on, we're either looking at the scripted notes or we're looking at the artifacts. Sometimes in domains two and three, teachers will also provide artifacts um, for what we actually saw in the classroom. Um, for example, you know, um, a teacher may give me the, the actual lab that the students are doing that day. And so I'll put that into domain three as well. And um, one of the hardest things that teachers, and even observers early on, is understanding the subtle nuances between the performance levels 
Okay, I'm going to give you an exercise. We do this with our teachers, and I, I pre slug some of it for you. Go ahead and unpaper the clip. The cards in the top left hand corner. If you look at the first row, so we give these to the teachers and we ask them, okay, take all the yellow cards out of your envelope. And I want you to put the performance levels, align them up to the boxes. So you'll see the top <coughs> right, it'll say excellent, and then proficient needs improvements. We ask them just to put them in the boxes. I've already done that for you. If you would, go ahead and read from left to right, from unsatisfactory to excellent. Read the performance descriptor from each. What would be the variety of sources that the teacher would have? That's a great question. I'm not going to answer that just yet. If we don't uncover it by the time we're done with this, let me know and we'll come back to it. So based upon the descriptors that you have so far, look at your SMART card. Can you identify what component we're actually talking about here? And I'll narrow you, your focus down to domain one. Which component in domain one are we describing here? Mm. A. Are we actually talking about teachers' content knowledge or are we talking about their knowledge well, of students? Relation, out of relationships. Well, prerequisite relationships has to do with the content. Does the okay. teacher know what content comes before and after a particular piece of content? Gotcha. Evelyn, why did you say B? It's knowledge of students. Notice the sub bullets. It's got student mm -hmm. skills, knowledge, proficiency, interest, and culture, heritage. You see those buzzwords in here somewhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, we're actually looking at component 1B. Okay. So the next thing we have um, the teachers do with the rest of the cards is you'll notice some of the cards are labeled examples and some of the cards are labeled critical attributes. And I've put together three examples already for you on your placemat. I've given you the critical attributes for needs improvement, and I've given you the examples for unsatisfactory and for excellent. Your task is to try to come up with the critical attributes and examples for what's left.
feel pretty confident? <laughs> oh, that's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how you did. For the critical attributes, if you notice in the bottom, the last critical attribute, very last yeah, line. Those letters were Yes. <laughs> you should have ADMP from left to right. And for your examples, you should have G, J, S, V. So anything you want to comment on in terms of as we're moving from unsatisfactory to excellent, some things that stood out to you in terms of the performance and the expectations. There's quite a difference between those two. It's like, I give a shit, right? I don't care. Right. The extremes, and you're right, yeah. and observers and teachers recognize that the two extremes are vastly different uh -huh. from each other. Two and three, a little bit more differences. Where we have the struggle and that nuance is between the proficient and the excellent is what really makes the excellent teacher so much different from the proficient. You're right. So we're going from left to right. I don't know anything about my students and I really don't care to, yeah, I know some stuff about my students but I'm still teaching to the whole class. Proficient is, I know my students, I recognize there's three different levels. Fourth is, I recognize even within my little groups that there are some specific nuances between my students and I may do something individually for those kids moving forward. And I'm constantly assessing where my students are at. The proficient and excellent is kind of the difference between I know my students by groups as I know my student as an individual, individual. which is much trickier. Yes, yes, exactly. So getting to your question, Kim, about what are some things that teachers do to get to know their students? Lots and lots of things. One, within Power School, we identify for special needs students their accommodations and modifications. And that's something that really distinguishes teachers in that continuum is one, are you even aware that you have special ed students in your class? <laughs> Are you even aware that they have accommodations and modifications? You may be aware, but you still don't follow them. As opposed to, yes, I follow them, or I do something very specific. Do you know your English language learners? What are you doing differently for those students? So some things that teachers do, um, the first week of school, a lot of teachers do an interest inventory with their students. Tell me a little bit about yourself. And they ask them to do some writing, um, exit slips, what have you. The key is, it's great that you know that information. What are you doing with it to impact student learning? And that's where some teachers get it and some teachers not, not getting it. And so we continue to have that conversation. Okay, it's really great that you know five of your kids love football, three of your kids love to read Harry Potter. Can you find opportunities to bring those into the classroom in whatever way that, that means? It could be a problem, it could be a reading, it could be allowing students to express themselves in a, a project. Is are you aware of that and you're finding those opportunities to bring that into the classroom? Right. And hopefully those kids are answering honestly and, you know, because that could be a hindrance for the teachers sure. if they don't put anything down or they just slap it up or, you know, or their friends answer instead of taking it home to mom and dad. Yep. I've even seen stuff come home, you know, from my kids. Or, you know, well, they want your answer on this, you know. And I'm like, all right, well, let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Just write something down. And I'm like, no, they don't want you to just write something down. They wouldn't send it home if that's what they wanted. Right. You know, but they do talk about, oh, you know, so and so have their friends do it. It's like, you know. Yeah, so it's, again, it's are not we. not fair, really, to the No, yeah. no, and it's not. Um, you know, unless, and here's where maybe um, we need to kind of shift the focus is don't give an activity and then just do that completion. If you're having the parents engage in a conversation with their student, make sure you're bringing them back into the classroom and continuing that discussion. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you would, I would hope that a teacher could recognize when, when an answer is from a friend <laughs> as opposed to a parent. Yep. So we use this, first of all, starting off with the performance level. Yes, it gives you a general idea of what it means to be an unsatisfactory needs improvement proficient or excellent, but then we're stepping it down even further. The critical attributes are what we actually, we as observers, use to provide specific evidence back to the teacher. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in a minute. 
And if that's still not clear, well, here's some examples of what it looks like at each performance level. Do you see yourself in these different areas? And if you're falling in one particular performance level, do you see what it would take to get to the next level? And let's have a conversation about that. And they're seeing these kind of things ahead of time and after evaluation so that they've got all of this yes. to work with. Every teacher has access to the, to the framework with the critical attributes, and we refer to it during all of our conversations. Yep. And, and I'm going to show you how we specifically use the critical attributes. So at the end of an observation, a teacher can go back into the framework and know exactly where their performance lies. And then it's up to them to say, yeah, that really wasn't representative of my work, or I know I do some things differently, let me show you. And do they know, for example, like a science teacher? So they, you know, you have your curriculum and at certain points you're doing a lab and you know, you're just there. You can't, it's hard to manipulate the time that you're doing the lab because it's gonna fall into, tie into the curriculum time. So are there ways to say, you know what this, for a teacher to say this is gonna be a great time for me to be observed mm -hmm. because I'm at this point in this chapter that, you know, is really going to show where my ability is. How does that work for the timing of their... Yeah, that's a great question. Language. So I mentioned, let's just talk about a tenured teacher, because it's about the same for a non-tenured teacher. So a tenured teacher has two observations. One of them is formal, and they actually get to pick the class, the period, the time of the year they want to see that. So you're exactly right. If I know I'm doing a certain activity, lab, writing exercise that I think is really strong and I want somebody to see it, then that's what I'm going to build my formal observation around. Okay? And the reason we have them pick the period and um, the class is because everything they do, the lesson plans and the planning conference questionnaire is specific to that period. Mm -hmm. We want to know that you know your kids and you're planning for those kids, not for a seventh period or an eighth period, specifically for a third period if that's what you choose. Then the second observation, which is the informal, we as the observer choose. But we give the teacher a one week notice. We'll say, Kim, we'll give you a two day school day notice. We're coming in, I'm coming in next week to observe you. And the reason we do that is it gives the teacher an opportunity to tell me, don't come on Friday, I'm on a field trip. So now I have 20 opportunities to see this, the teacher instead of 25. But then we get to see more authentic teaching as opposed to potentially the dog and pony show if the teacher always gets to pick. And so that, you know, we want to make sure that we're seeing authentic teaching. So they teaching. have a chance at each. They have a chance at each. And in addition, let's say you wanted to see the lab. I, showed maybe, I saw maybe a traditional lecture. The teacher can request then another drop-in, which is not necessarily a full 55 minutes. It could be 15 minutes. It could be 20 minutes. It could be half an hour. But I'm specifically, they're asking me to come see group work or whatever else they want me to see. And I, as an observer, can also do a drop in. If, let's say, I'm going through all my scripted notes and I see, wow, I don't have anything for 2D, I'm going to do a drop in because I want to look at managing student behavior. Because for whatever reason, I just wasn't focused on that. So there's opportunities for additional observations requested by the teacher or the observer, and that can be announced or unannounced. So if they didn't see something on here, they really should be going back, maybe even if it is just for 20 minutes, to get that instead of yes. you know zinging the teacher like, oh, but they just didn't have that yeah. in, in the lesson. Well, we cannot provide a performance rating without evidence to back it up. Okay. So you can't have a box that's empty. Something has to be in it. So okay. that either requires us to go back in or ask for artifacts. Okay. Great question. I would think, though, that the, the biggest argument is between proficient and excellent because they want excellent, they expect excellent. I don't imagine a lot of them are getting it because that's pretty tough. It depends on the components. Depends on the components. So what we try to encourage the teachers, and we did the first year, is before you even started your evaluation, we asked them to go through all 22 components and read the entire framework and do a self-assessment. Where do you think you are on each of the 22 components? And try to be honest with yourself. Nobody's going to see it but you. This is what the expectation is. Are you meeting the proficient, or are you meeting the excellent, or are you meeting something less? And then what it is, is it that you want to focus on? We don't expect teachers to be excellent in all 22. And, in, and Charlotte will actually tell you that's pretty rare. And a teacher may be excellent in one component one year and proficient the next year. Because it depends upon the class. It depends upon your students. It may be a brand new course to you that we're seeing. You know, so there's a lot of variables. So it flows from one year to the next. 
Um, and we're going to get down towards the end, I'll talk about what does it actually take to be excellent. Here the teachers know the criteria, and it's up to the teacher to decide, you know what, 1B, I'm good with proficient. I want to make sure that I'm solid, I know my kids really well, I'm working to different ability levels, I'm not ready to really differentiate for individual kids, and that's okay. We definitely don't want to see you in the needs improvement or unsatisfactory, but try to, you know, to maintain a solid proficient or better. So that's the, the framework in terms of the expectation, and, and same thing for all 22 components, there's the performance level descriptors, there are the critical attributes, and there are examples for each and every one. Okay. So let's talk about how do we actually use that then to do some performance rating. So we're going to look at questioning and discussion technique. You can go ahead and paper clip your cards back together for me. So questioning and discussion technique is the only instructional strategy in the entire framework. And the reason it's in there is this really helps develop students' deeper understanding. If you go back to what we talked about, the research on how students learn, this is a key piece. Kids need to take the factual knowledge that we're trying to build with them and apply it into many different situations. We were at uh, a training today for instructional practice inventory by Dr. Jerry Valentine. And his research looks at student learning, student thinking, critical thinking in the classroom. And it's on a scale of one to six. One being complete disengagement to six. Students are doing that metacognitive, that self-assessment, um, that deep analysis, creative thinking, that's a level six. And a level five, he said, is the most powerful impact on student learning and it's discussion. Getting students engaged with talking about the content, the concepts, the skills. This particular component invites students to form hypotheses, make connections, challenge viewpoints. So again, recognizing here's what I think, here's what somebody else thinks. Is it contradicting, supporting, or are we just going to agree to disagree? Kind of a thing. Helps increase connection between content or events. Students formulate high-level questions is evidence that the skill is being taught. When we get, can get the students to ask higher-order questions, we know that they're thinking more deeply about the subject matter. So let's look at an example. And here's how we now take the scripted evidence that the observer collects. Now the observer is actually doing this work. The observer takes the scripted evidence uses the framework and tries to analyze what the, the pattern of behavior looks like. So let me show you how to read this. We're just looking at 3B. I have two pieces of evidence. From my scripted notes, I have two entries. Now, you don't actually have the entries. We're just kind of doing a superficial alignment here. But I would go back to what does this line of text say? These two pieces of evidence together tell me the teacher is using open-ended questions to invite students to think and offer multiple answers. So the pieces of evidence were actually questions that the teacher asked. And, and what do I mean by open-ended questions? There could be more discussion to it. Yeah, simply not a yes or no. Right. Or a memorized. Yeah. yeah, I'm not looking for some, some single correct answer. It's open-ended because I want to hear everybody's thoughts. Okay, so those two pieces of evidence align. This is my analysis. Okay, where does that fall in the framework? Look at the critical attributes and actually look for the verbiage. Teacher uses open-ended questions to invite student thinking proficient. It is the top critical attribute. Helps if I get on the right page there. So it's critical attribute number one for proficient. My second piece of evidence is the line of script from 759 to 803. So there's actually multiple lines of script. Remember, I'm looking at that whole body, and I'm seeing, do I see a pattern here? 
That evidence aligns to this frame, uh, critical attribute. Teacher frames questions during the closing of the lesson with single correct answers. Where does that fall? And this one's kind of... Did you make effect with use of weight then? No. Because you're saying the closing of words. No, the clo I mean, that's just telling you when it happens, but I'm looking for the teacher frames questions with single correct answers. I condensed this one because it was a little lengthy. Well, the basic, uh, as students to justify the reasoning? No, if you look at the basic, basic level two, level two uh, critical oh, attribute number okay. one. Teacher frames some questions designed to promote student thinking, but many have single correct answers. So right now, based upon the evidence that I have for the first observation, I have a proficient performance level and I have a needs improvement. So as a teacher, again, I can go into the framework and I can identify where I'm falling. One of the changes that we made this year, midway through the process, is teachers still wanted quick feedback. So we're actually telling them this is a P and this is an NI. So they can get that quick snapshot of where I'm at. Now, right now, if I were the observer and this was my teacher, I would have the conversation of, I'm not really sure where your performance lies. I only have this body of evidence. So I'm, I don't want to say you're solidly proficient, but I don't want to say you're solidly needs improvement. This is an area that you want to focus on. And let's talk about some strategies about your questioning techniques to make sure that we're not doing this rapid fire looking for a single response. We want to make sure that students are understanding the information deeply. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now this is not their overall performance rating at this point. This is one observation, one snapshot. We need to add a layer to that. So if you flip it over, I'll let you do this one on your own. So now we have a second observation. I've got three pieces of evidence. There's a lot of information in there. I've got three critical attributes. See if you can identify the performance levels. Piece of evidence. Students invite comments from their classmates. Where in the performance level is this? Proficient. You're proficient. I have a, a four. A level four. Level four. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is actually the excellent, and it's critical attribute number four. 
So if you count the fourth bullet down, mm -hmm. students invite comments from their classmates during a discussion to challenge one another's thinking. Second piece of evidence aligns to teacher uses open-ended questions to engage students. Proficient. Proficient, bullet number one. Third set of evidence, this was data collected on a seating chart. During the course of the lesson and when data was tracked, nine out of 31 students responded. Only a few students dominated the question. So that's the critical attribute right there. Only a few students dominated the discussion. Where does that fall? Level two. So I keep going backwards. Go on the left. Oh. Unsatisfactory. Yeah, it's the last bullet in unsatisfactory, number four. Oh, I see. So now as an observer, and even as a teacher, what we do is we take a look at the collected body of evidence. And we look for a preponderance of evidence. What is the evidence telling us? If you had to give the teacher a rating today, an overall performance rating, what would it be, and why? I'm giving them a proficient. Okay. So you have two proficients and an excellent. Right. Can you agree? I agree. Yeah, they need a little bit of work, but again, if if only a few students are participating, that doesn't necessarily reflect that the teacher is unsatisfactory. It could be the students you know, just weren't participating, but with the other proficients in there, I would say, you know, they're where they should be with that. Yeah, and it's, it, and this is where it becomes a little tricky in a sense that, you know, we do have this one piece of excellence, but it was one student. It wasn't a lot of students, so we don't know if this is common practice. Oh, so the SS is multiple, I missed that piece, mm -hmm. okay. Sorry, I should have. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes, SS is multiple students. Obviously, the T is teacher. One S is a single student. One student. Okay. But there are some tendencies or there are some culture in the classroom where it's a, we invite students to question each other and to engage. So there's something going on there, but we don't know if it's part of their practice all the time. Kim, as you also mentioned, this, this unsatisfactory piece, maybe it was that particular lesson of the day. Maybe the teacher was rushed. I mean, there's a lot of variables in there. So in essence, these almost cancel out. We can't say it's necessarily one or the other. We know we want to have this continued discussion about this rapid fire. We still don't know if it's an issue or not. And if you notice, the proficiency is the same critical attribute. Mm -hmm. So we can say for sure the teacher's use of open-ended questions is common in their practice. They, they did it multiple times. We would probably give this teacher a proficient, I might even go in for a drop-in, and just focus on questioning and discussion techniques so that I'm really clear, is this a solid proficient? Is it more than proficient? Or am I moving more towards the needs improvement? Mm -hmm. But that's how we use the critical attributes to analyze what the evidence is actually saying, and then the teacher can start charting their own growth. And then they can say, you know what, why don't you come in next week, I'm doing a Socratic seminar, et cetera. Or mm -hmm. I may decide, you know what, I'm not 100% clear on the practice, I'm going to do a drop-in, but I'm just going to focus on the 3B. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do for all 22 components. But specifically for domains 2 and 3, when we're looking at scripted evidence, this is what it looks like. And who are the observers? Any administrator in the district that's completed the certification training, and that's every administrator in this district okay. observes. Whether you're an athletic director, a dean, supervisor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everybody. So last piece, piece, and we're just about done, is let's put this together. So we have all of this information. We're constantly giving this feedback to the teachers. How do we come up with our overall performance rating? And the slogan that the District Evaluation Committee came up with to help teachers remember, again, we're only talking about the Danielson piece, we're not talking about student growth, is it takes three. And if we can remember it takes three, we can calculate our performance levels. So again, here's the framework. This is actually the summative evaluation um, 
worksheet that the teacher will get, and they will get a rating for all 22 components. Let me pause for a second and let you know that at the end of each observation, on the, the end of the formal or informal observation, we're, get, we're sitting down with the teacher and we're going over all this evidence. And we're having a conversation about where the performance lies, some possible areas of improvement. But one of the things that we're required by law to do is if a teacher is heading down the path of needs improvement or unsatisfactory, we actually tell them. And we, tell, we, we put in a place last year, we specifically check NI or U. And as uncomfortable as that is in the process, it's important that the teacher is aware of the difference because one is, you read and you saw the performance levels, one is more extreme than the other. Unsatisfactory is teachers doing harm to students and that's more grave than a needs improvement. We've got some issues, but you're, you're not heading down that egregious route. But we tell you up front where you actually lie and our goal is to help you improve and move out of it and we'll give you some specific strategies. So we actually sit down and they sign off that we've had this conversation, because it protects both sides. I've made you aware as a teacher, and it's also protecting me that we've had this conversation as the observer. So you can't come back and say, well, you never told me I was unsatisfactory. Remember, we signed off, we had a conversation about it. So at the end, as the observer goes through and, and puts together all their evidence, they're marking all the boxes based on that preponderance of evidence. And so a teacher will get a rating for every single component in every single domain. Okay. What we want to stress here is that it takes three. I'm going to show you the, the box and then we'll come back and do an example. So I'm going to start in the bottom right hand corner. For a teacher to be excellent, now this is the domain only, so think about domain one, planning and preparation. In order for me to be excellent, I have to have half the components rated excellent with everything else being proficient. So there's six components in domain one. I need three out of six. Not all six, just half. So domains one and four, I need three out of six. Domains two and three, I need three out of five. Proficient, I can have one component rated needs improvement and the rest can be proficient or excellent, and I can still be proficient overall. A needs improvement, I have more than one component rated needs improvement, with the rest being proficient or excellent. And then unsatisfactory, remember this is egregious, this is teachers doing harm to students. If one or more components are rated unsatisfactory, that entire domain is unsatisfactory, because we have a serious problem. Are you seeing that a lot? Not a lot. We've seen a couple, but we haven't seen a lot. So let's go back to domain one. And this is where we really wanted to get the teachers into the framework, doing a self-assessment and identifying where are my strengths as an individual. I may be really good at my content. I may be really good at knowing my students. And I may be really good at designing instruction. But maybe my outcomes my resources and my assessments are okay, but maybe not individualized specific to, to unique students. But because I have three, oops, I did that wrong thing, sorry. Because I have three excellence, I'm excellent overall in domain one. Over here in domain two, I may be excellent in creating relationships. I'm not really 100% clear what this culture for learning is, but I have a good environment. I want my kids to be successful. I've got rock solid classroom procedures. My students are well behaved and they know my expectations in my physical space. You know, I may forget to do some things here or there, but it's, it's a safe learning environment. I've got three out of five, I'm excellent overall. Over in instruction, I deliver my content really clearly. I don't make any mistakes. I'm really clear with my procedures and my directions. Maybe I struggle with getting all my students to participate. Depending upon my class, sometimes students engage a little bit more than others. I'm really strong in engaging students in my learning. I don't always give feedback to my students, but I try based upon what we're learning. And I definitely demonstrate flexibility and responsiveness. I'd be excellent overall. So I could have any, a teacher can have any combination of the three excellence, it doesn't matter. 
we don't say some dis what some districts have done when they put their evaluation process together is they said if you aren't excellent in 3b you're not excellent in domain one if you're not excellent in classroom procedures you're not excellent in domain two et cetera et cetera what's wrong with doing that though mm -hmm. well it limits them because it, there's just so many different circumstances to what your classroom is and you know where you are and the, the, the environment and yeah sure so somebody else chose what the most important part of that domain is We've just introduced bias into the framework. Right. Who am I to say that classroom procedures is the most important? The research says every single one of these components is important. Mm -hmm. No one is more important than the other. Just like we talked about that framework familiarity, you have to have one to have the other. That's a balance. It's a balance. I could end up being proficient in domain four across the board, but remember the slogan, it takes three. If I have three domains that are excellent, I'm excellent overall. Now when you see an unsatisfactory, what's what gets done for that teacher? What happens right away? Okay, so there's a couple of things. First of all, if I get an unsatisfactory in in a domain, and I'm gonna use my cheat sheet. If I have one domain rated unsatisfactory then um, I'm a needs improvement. And a needs improvement requires a teacher to, develop, to create a professional development plan. So they create a professional development plan around the item that's unsatisfactory. Um, let's say, for example, let's say it's here, creating an environment of respect and report. Teacher has absolutely no respect and report for students. There's sarcasm in the classroom. Kids are constantly yelling at each other, what have you. The teacher would create a professional development plan focused on this component and we would work together as a team. I might say, you know what, why don't you go to this professional development, we'll come back and talk about it, talk about some strategies, read this book, what have you. So they create a professional development plan focused on improving this component and the teacher gets evaluated again next year. If I have more than one domain rated unsatisfactory, my entire performance is unsatisfactory. Now I go on remediation. Remember, that's a teacher doing harm to students. Mm -hmm. Now we get the lawyers involved and we create a very specific plan to try to either remediate that teacher, and if they're irremediable, then they'll potentially be terminated. So I don't know if you saw when I had this up here. How many components out of the 22 does it take to be excellent overall? Nine. Nine. Excellent mm -hmm. is still a, it's the tip. Mm -hmm. So when we try to get teachers to understand, we don't expect you to be excellent in all 22. And in fact, it's in some cases impossible. Mm -hmm. Find the opportunities, find those areas where you feel you have your strengths and go for the excellence in those because you only need three in three domains. And that makes it a little bit more um, palpable, able to tackle than trying to focus on all 22. And you can have any combination. Maybe you're proficient in domain one, but you're excellent in the other three. You don't have to have a particular pattern of excellence to be excellent overall. So let me just show you the, so then here's the summative rating. Again, this is just the professional practice piece. If I have more than one domain rated unsatisfactory, I'm unsatisfactory overall. This is a remediation plan. If I have one domain unsatisfactory or more than one domain needs improvement, now I'm on a professional development plan. Here in proficient, I'm allowed one domain needs improvement. That means I've got two components that are needs improvement but it's not severe enough to kick me into a professional development plan. I can still be proficient, as long as everything else is proficient or excellent. And then three out of the four domains must be excellent, with the rest proficient. So this was pre-data. Whatever the summative rating was, 
the teacher then was assigned to a group based upon their performance. Next month we'll look at the student growth data. That produces a rating that's now 30% of a teacher's evaluation. So we have to take the data piece, now this becomes 70%. Okay. Questions, comments, or reflections? How long does it take to compile all that for one evaluation? Depends on the observer. Um, I would say the first couple of years, it took a long time. Uh -huh. I mean, you were spending 20 plus hours on each teacher because you were learning the tools, you were learning the framework, the coding, the alignment piece, um, talking to observers this year, that time has decreased. The key is the more you know the framework, the easier it is to code. Mm -hmm. You know, so some observers are saying, once I'm done in the classroom, I go lock myself in a room so I'm undisturbed and it's fresh in my head and I can knock the code out in a half an hour and already send it back to the teacher. And some observers are even saying, once I do that, I stay in the moment and I actually put the evidence in the evaluation, I'm done that day right. with that observation. It almost seems, if you don't, it almost seems unfair because you, know, you should be doing that right afterward if, if it can be coordinated that way with the timing for the observer yes. that they then have that time to go and just finish those pieces of, of that. Absolutely, it's not so much that it's unfair, it's more that it's fresh in your head. Right. Because now if I put it down, and two weeks later I come back to it, now I gotta go read the script from top to bottom again, as opposed to, I already remember what I wrote, I know what I wanna say, and just dump it right into the evaluation. Right. So one of the things that we're looking at um, this month, I have a team of administrators, we are looking at four pieces of software that's gonna help speed this up even more. And that getting rid of the paperwork and collating all these different pieces of evidence, it's in one place. But the software is not putting in the coding. The, the observer still has to do that. Yeah. But the, like I said, that piece has gotten more and more efficient because we already know, we know the framework well enough that we recognize that's a 2A, that's a 2C, that's a 3D, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then the software- Getting this down good yes. while they're sitting there, that's gonna be helpful. Yes. Some observers have gotten to the point where as soon as they script the text, they're coding it right there. But they've gotten really good at that piece. Not everybody's up to that point. Yeah, because you don't want to miss what the teacher's doing you either. Don't. Yeah. You don't. And that's hard. I mean, you know, we still wrestle with the fact that, oh, I just missed what that student said because I was writing down this question. What we try to instill with the observers is it's better that you capture less script but of more quality than a lot of script that says nothing. You know, if you just constantly say, teacher asked a question, teacher asked a question, teacher asked a question, students asked a question, student responded, but you don't actually record what they say, mm -hmm. you don't know, was the question higher order? Was the question about uh, not understanding a direction? The question itself tells you a lot and aligns to different components and different sure. performance levels. So I'd rather have less script of better quality that you can really focus on. And then forgive yourself for missing something, you can always go back and do a drop-in. Mm -hmm. How many uh, people, how many teachers do each administrator have? Depends on the position. Um, principal, most positions, principals, um, athletic directors, assistant principals have four. Deans, uh, we try to keep to three because they are the ones that get pulled away the most. Supervisors have five. Um, so it depends anywhere from three to five. Some districts, when I talk to principals and curriculum directors, I know one curriculum director has 20 observations to do, 20 teachers to evaluate, wow. 10 to evaluate. You know, we by far have the fewest. Yeah, that's that, and it could it'd be bigger depending on how many teachers are. Yes. And it fluctuates. This year is the year where we have less teachers up for observation. Next year we have more. And it just depends when you have the wave of retirees. Every year. Correct. It's every other year. It depends on how many non-tenured teachers you have. And so we also try to divvy up. We don't want one person getting stuck with all the non-tenures because they have one more observation to do than the tenured. So we try to divvy it up. The other unique piece is the school service personnel. So when I, when I say that, I mean counselors, psychologists, social workers. Each one of those positions has a different framework. So one of the things we didn't realize early on is one person got stuck with four different positions. Oh, wow. That's a 
while there's some similarities, there's a lot of differences. So it was taking that person even longer to shift from a teacher framework to a social worker framework to a counselor framework. So this year we tried to make sure is if you get at most two different positions, but you get multiple people in the same position. So you may have three counselors and a teacher or three teachers and two social workers would have it to try to keep it, you know, that limit, the variety of frameworks, which helps. And I know this was, I know we had to take the class so we could fire people or whatever. Um, how, isn't there, I know you, you talked about um, professional development plans, remediation plans. Mm -hmm. So there's a year or two built into it, and it just doesn't happen once and they're walking out the door. They have, they have a chance to remediate. Yes, so going back to, oops. Let's go back to the last slide here. So a teacher that ends up here overall for their practice, they develop a professional development plan. That kicks in right away. So the observer and, and, and the observer and the teacher work on it together. So the observer starts putting together in the framework all the areas of needs improvement are unsatisfactory and then sits down with the teacher and says, okay, let's work together on how you're going to improve. So that kicks in right away and then in August that teacher gets evaluated again with the same observer. Okay, so they're not in danger of losing their job. This is their opportunity to coach, remediate, and improve. If a teacher ends up here in unsatisfactory, now again it kicks in right away and we have a 90 day window. And this is very specific, we need whatever those issues are, they need to be fixed immediately and we're going to directly observe. Not only that, but make sure that nothing else is falling off the wagon. And a lot of times we involve two observers and we alternate. One observer, will do, and there's three observations, one will do the first, a different one will do the second, the first one comes back and does the third to make sure that we're not biased and we're mm -hmm. We're um, looking at evidence. Depending upon the outcome of that process, that 90 day process, either the teacher is remediated or not remediated, and then it goes to the board for termination if they're not remediable. And if they're remediated in that 90 days, is there another checkup within the next 90 to make sure they just didn't get fixed in the 90 so that you know they're fixed and then another two months down the road they're right back to old habits. Yeah, we always have the right to evaluate the teacher again. At the end of the remit, and it, you know, it's kind of walking that fine line. You don't want to be on the verge of harassing the teacher right. to improve, but again, like you said, we want to make sure that they're continuing to go in the right direction. So if they come out of the remediation plan with their proficient, they actually go back on cycle. Okay. They have a year off and then they're evaluated again, but if we feel we need to evaluate that person again, we can. If they end up in a needs improvement, they go into a professional development plan and they get evaluated right away again. Okay. So it depends on the outcome of the remediation plan. Since I've been here, we've only had one teacher on remediation. <clears throat> and we, this year we have a teacher on a professional development plan. And how much do you think the 30% of student scores will affect the end of the... You know, um, <laughs> It's interesting because the way the it mathematically works out, um, it doesn't necessarily have such a dramatic impact that I think the teachers were stressing out about. Um, I bet there's a correlation. <coughs> we, we'll have to see. We don't know um, right now because not some teachers only have a type three, some have both. So it'll be interesting to see how that data plays out. Um, and we'll look at the performance ratings off the top of my head. I know, here, let's, let's go to the website. So at the end of this year, you will have completed a, a complete cycle of this evaluation process? Yes, with data. I didn't want that. Um, here we go. So. For each type of assessment, whether it's a type two or a type three, if 80 to 100% of my students show growth, and whatever the growth is, for the type two, it's one more question, correct? For the type three, the teacher actually comes up with a target. So if 80 to 100% of my teachers show, show my growth, I get an excellent. 60 to 79% is proficient. 
40 to 59% needs improvement if less than 40% of my students show growth on unsatisfactory. This is actually the state model three years from now. And we'll get into the history about that next month, but that just kind of gives you an idea of where we are. Then I take and I put my two types of data together. So if I have a type two, let's say I get a needs improvement in my type two. And in my type three, I get a proficient. I just follow the matrix. I would be proficient for my student data. This is now 30% of my evaluation. So you can see, in, for a teacher to get unsatisfactory in student growth, they would have had to have gotten an unsatisfactory in both. Needs improvement, they would have gotten an unsatisfactory and a proficient, or it needs improvement and unsatisfactory. Excellence, they had, to, they had to have gotten excellent in at least one to get an excellent overall for their data piece. So that's how the data piece shakes out. And then if we look at putting that together with the performance rating. So here's my student data piece. This is 30%. So if I got a proficient in my data and I got an excellent in my performance, I'm excellent overall. If I got an excellent in my data and an excellent in Danielson, and I'm excellent overall. And you'll see the only way a teacher would go on remediation is I was unsatisfactory in my Danielson, which is 70%. Remember, we're doing harm to students. Or, and I got a needs improvement or unsatisfactory in my data. These people would go on a PDP, so that professional development plan. Otherwise, I'm proficient or excellent. Mm -hmm. We'll look more in depth at, at the data piece next month. So that's all I have. Do you have any other? I, I know. Okay. One is, um, I don't know what your work schedule is, but is it possible to make this meeting earlier than 7? Can you do 6.30? Yeah. I can do 6.30, sure. That'd be great. Do you think Debbie could do 6.30? She doesn't work, so okay. I don't think it's an issue. Yeah, I could do six thirty. That'd be great. Yes, that would be that would be good too. Okay. And the other, there was an article in Sunday's paper about a UPS, and I think I read it correctly. I don't I think the law has passed, but they're forcing the, the universities to accept the three. Yes. For college credit. Yes. I think that's the big news that we need to get out there. Absolutely. Because I know. I, for example, at U of I, you had to get a four in the English test to get mm -hmm. So now it, it's that's a big deal. Yes. Absolutely. Do you hear anything more on the SAT, ACT? I'm Outside of that. what I um, sent to Dr. Kendall for the mid-month memo, uh -huh. um, that's all we know so far. Um, we don't know when the end of the appeal process will be. Um, Dr. Smith, in his weekly notice, is still strongly putting out there that he plans on giving the SAT this spring. And we still don't know test dates and funding. And it's all about money. Yes. Getting a better deal. It is. One thing we are looking at, and I'm, I'm having a discussion with the principals, talking about the ACT, which is coming up in March. Um, according to some of the assistant principals, not all of the universities are using the writing anymore for placement. So we're looking at possibly not doing the writing, which would be a significant savings for okay. us. So instead of $70,000, we're only looking at about $45,000. So we're looking, as long as it's not gonna hurt students for placement purposes, we may just eliminate the writing for this year. So I'll keep you posted on that, which will help. I feel bad for the kids, you know, especially like sophomores and juniors now, with well, sophomores especially, because next year they'll be doing the test taking and who knows what to prepare them right. for. And if we get a notice soon enough that it's going to be SAT, we may actually try to give the sophomores a practice SAT in March instead of the ACT, if that's where we're going. It looked like from what was in the mid month memo, <laughs> memo that there's a lot of online 
tutorials and practice. SAT. Yes. For the SAT. Yes. SAT oh, wow. partnered with Khan Academy and actually in all of their paraphernalia and throughout their district webs or their um, website, they talk about how they believe they also being Khan Academy um, believe that all students should have equitable access to test prep free of charge. I so, couldn't agree more. Tons of videos, tons of practice problems, apps on their iPad and their phone, automatically grades practice tests. Yes, so I think that would be very advantageous for our students. And looking at the sample test questions, I think what we're doing curricularly with our type two assessments, we're aligned, because it's very park-like. What we've been doing to prepare kids for park is also what SAT is like. And our district writing assessments, that document-based writing is pretty much what the SAT essay is all about too. So I think we're in, in a good position. I feel a lot more comfortable knowing we're going towards the new SAT. If we had to take the old SAT, it's, it, yeah, I, I would not be happy about it. But the fact that it, the new SAT is very much aligned to the Common Core, the critical thinking skills, what we're focusing on right now, I think we're in a good position for our kids. It's just getting over that transition period and, and making sure, okay, this is our target now. Let's make sure we're focusing on these critical thinking and writing skills. And what about what, what's happening for like the younger kids, uh, you know, when they do, um, what is it that they do with the testing in the middle schools? Now? Well, they do park now too. Oh, they are doing park now too, that's right. Yep. They are. So that'll help them out as, as they transition into high school. Yes. Beyond that, yes. instead of the, um, the ISATs. Were the yes, the ISAT school. was completely different than PSA. Right, and what was the next one that they used to have that? Isn't there another? Well, the ISAT was their main stakes test, the high yeah. stakes test. Um, many of the feeder schools do the MAP testing. MAP testing. For the That's placement. what I'm thinking of. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Placement purposes, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, ladies. Okay.